everybody. Welcome to the Fish Passage 2021 online uh, webinar. Um, we have about 4,000 registrations for the four days that uh, the Fish Passage Conference will be held from 90 different countries. And for today, we have about 1,100 uh, registrations who will uh, attend. This is a four-day webinar that will be uh, broadcasted in four different time zones. During this conference, we will showcase 12 international invited speakers to present their research and work from all around the world. We will visit 12 projects live on, lay on location and interview with the researchers at the, at the spot and host discussions and breakout sessions. Today is the session for North and South America with speakers from Canada, USA, Brazil and Argentina. We will go live to three locations and have presentations from three, three speakers. Before we start, I would like to make a few announcements to the participants. Participants, you can only see and listen. If you have questions, you can ask them in the Q&A that are questions with regard to the contents of the presentations. You can also like the questions other people have asked and, and then they will raise in importance and get more uh, interest. Other types of questions you can ask in the chat if something goes wrong and also announcements by the uh, organizers will be placed in the, in the chat. Finally, if something goes wrong with the hack, we have a backup facility uh, uh, where we can log on to, and then we will send the uh, uh, information due the, during the event bright. But now let's move to the program. Here next to me is my special guest, Mrs. Avina Bokkens. She is vice governor of the province of Friesland in the Netherlands. She has a broad portfolio, in particular with traffic and infrastructure. At this moment, we are on the Afsluitdijk, which is a, a long dike between, uh, separating freshwater and marine uh, waters. And also, uh, and in, this in this dike, there will, will be an innovative fish migration facility uh, realized, about which she will say more. The Netherlands, she says, the Netherlands is great at water management and the fish migration uh, uh, river is another striking example. Fish will be allowed to move from marine to fresh water and back. Import an inventive uh, solution. And she will now tell more about this project. The floor is yours, Mrs. Fokkens. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, good afternoon and welcome to the 2021 Fish Passage Conference from the Astradijk in the Netherlands. My name is Avine Vokens and I am a vice governor of the province of Friesland. And it is with great pride that I welcome you all to this digital conference. A special welcome to the viewers of the live stream in North and South America, on which is this first day is focused. I'm pleased to see that the topic of fish migration is gaining more and more attention internationally. Working together and sharing information is, in my view, the best way to find solutions to barriers that blocks fish swimming routes. We are hosting the Fish Passage Conference on the Astradijk today and tomorrow because we are working here on a major and innovative solution to help fish migrate from the sea to the freshwater ecosystems. The last two days of the conference will be both broadcast from the Haring fleet, which is in the west of the Netherlands. Together, these two projects, Astradijk and Haring fleet, form the main entrances and exits of the Rhine River Basin. So now I am on the Astradijk, a special dam in the Netherlands connecting the provinces of Friesland and North Holland since 1932. For those who are not familiar with the Astradijk, it is a dam with a road for cars, cyclists and walkers 
of 32 kilometers right through the water. And it can be seen from space. We, the Dutchmen, are quite proud of this dam. But while the Ashtadijk protects the Netherlands against floods and connects parts of the country, the fish population benefits considerably less from this intervention. Not only did a fish-rich estuarine water environment disappear, the closure also created an impossible obstacle for fish such as salmon, eel, and smelt. Because of the Ashadijk, these migrate, migratory fish could no longer swim from the marine water sea to the freshwater Isomere and back. High time to restore this. A decade ago, in 2011, a number of people from the Water Sea Association and the anglers or professional fishermen came up with a plan to do something about this. A hole in the Osterdijk was the solution. And that was actually very strange. For many centuries, the Dutch have been building dikes and dams to protect the Netherlands against high water. Now, a hole in the dam will be needed to give the fish free rain again. Free rain again. The idea for the fish migration river was born. With this idea, sketched on the back of a beer coaster, they knocked at the door of the province of Friesland. We were enth enthusiastic. At first, we had carried out a um, feasibility study. Fortunately, the results were positive. With this, we as a province who are, um, adopted this project. The government, owner of the Asherdijk, also had to think and calculate very carefully whether this was possible. In the end, they agreed to make a hole in the dam for the fish. It was just at the right time, as climate change made it necessary for the government to make the Asherdijk stronger and higher. Then we had to look for money. The Dutch Postcardery Lottery, a lottery with many charities, including nature projects, quickly pledged the first millions. Money was also related, released from national and European, European, European subsidies, such as the Water Fund and LIFE. The government is also helping out. Ultimately, this project cost, will cost around 55 million euros. After that, many studies were conducted and draws made. Experts from all over the world have looked on and through along with us. Nowhere else in the world is there a project of this scale. The permanently open connection between salt and fresh water starts flowing as soon as the tide goes out. The fresh water of Lake IJsselmeer then flows through the fish migration river into the water sea and attracts fish to the opening with the special smell and taste of the Rhine. As soon as the tide comes in again, the rising water flows into the four kilometers long river. We now have a beautiful design that meets the requirements of both ecology and safety. We also want to make this project accessible for research, knowledge sharing and science. Partly thanks to the World Fish Migration Foundation, our project is receiving internationally worldwide attention. And rightly so. Work has now started on the hole in the dam. A few weeks ago, I was allowed to visit the works on the hole in the dam. It was an impressive experience. I imagined how millions of fish would swim from the water sea into the Isomer through that same large passage. The passageway with visitors will also be able to walk along the river for the fish. We are still working on the design and perfecting the operation for the fish migration river. The hole in the dam has already been started. It will, it will take at least another year. After that, we expect 
it, 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 it's to be in 2022. We will continue building the river for the fish in the IJsselmeer and the water sea. We hope that the first fish will swim through this unique fish migration river in early 2025. Once the fish migration river is completed, researchers like you will continue to measure how the fish can find their way there and how they swim, uh, switch from salt water to fresh water and back again. We will then share this information with a national public that is standing here at the gate of Friesland. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you all a very useful and instructive conference these next four days from the Netherlands. And I hope to meet you in the future in person at, of course, the Afsluitdijk, the driveway to our beautiful province, Friesland. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Falkens, for the opening of this yes. uh, of this webinar. And uh, we are at this uh, unique place because uh, really it's incredible what type of fish migration facility will be built here, and at the same time still having the fresh water supply for the north of the of the Netherlands, and hopefully uh, the fish will find their way. Yes. Uh, to this uh, to this new facility in uh, by 2025. So thank you very much for You're having welcome. the time and coming here and opening this uh, this webinar. Yeah. Okay. We now move to the first uh, presentation, which will come from the United States by uh, Dr. Brian Kluwer, who is a senior scientist at the National Oceanic and At Atmospheric Administration (NOAA) at the Fisheries West Coast Region Department. Dr. Kluwer is a fluvial geomorphologist with over 30 years of federal service in fish river resource management. Before joining the National Marine Services in 2000, his focus area within the US National Park Service included re-regulating major dams in the Colorado River Basin to improve ecosystem functions and planning, monitoring dam removals across the West, notably the Elwa River dams. Since joining the National Marine Services in 2000, his focus has been divided between planning and implementing several dam removal projects and improving river restoration science and practice to support the recovery of threatened and endangered salmonids. Today, he will give a presentation with the title, Adding dimension, Dimensions to Fish Passage Considerations, Stage Zero, A New Concept and Recent Advantage in Floodplain Restoration. The floor is yours, Dr. Kluwer. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Let me see if I can get all the technology to work. And let me know if you see the presentation. Do you see my presentation? No, not yet. Not yet? Are you able to share your screen? Yeah. Um, Maybe I needed to hit one more button. Sorry about that. Perfect. All right, let's see what we've got. Is that my title slide? All right, thank you. Get started here. Good morning from Idaho and happy solstice everyone. And thanks for tuning in today. I'm really excited to share this presentation with you at the 2021 Fish Passage meeting. The outline of my talk today is um, I'll give you a background on floodplains and land use and connections to historic salmon habitat. It is um, from uh, my centric view of, of uh, the US and uh, I suspect you're far ahead of us in many ways in uh, the old world. So I hope to learn a lot today from you. I'll then give you a conceptual geomorphic and ecosystem model, the stream evolution model. And through that, I'll explain the concept of stage zero conditions, which might be a new term to some of you. Then I'll show you two implementation examples 
of valley resetting projects to immediate stage zero conditions in Oregon. And I'll wrap up my presentation with a discussion of connectivity in the context of the salmon life cycle. So we've all been working on dams, diversions, and other channel constructs uh, that are barriers to fish migration, and they close off miles of habitat and watershed inputs. And fish passage efforts have rightly focused on removing barriers to the in-channel network and reconnecting blue line stream -like. I've worked my whole career on dam removal projects, and many of you have as well. But in addition to channel barriers, there are extensive levees, or road embankments, and channel stabilization measures along nearly every river in arable valleys worldwide. These lateral barriers disconnect rivers from their former floodplain ecosystems. This 2016 paper by Hauer and others is a good summary of ecological differences between developed and undeveloped alluvial valleys. The illustration shows the complexity of the shifting habitat mosaic and the biophysical interactions among organisms stretching from microbes to apex predators, such as grizzly bears in this diagram. For the rest of my presentation, you'll see why I think it's important to fish passage efforts add dimensions to include connectivity to land use outside the channel. The scale of human hydro modification of Earth's alluvial valleys is hard for many people to comprehend, even people who work in our field. And often there is little documentation of the changes over time. One example where we do have good documentation is California's Central Valley, where the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers flow to San Francisco Bay. The historical Central Valley salmon habitat shown here as blue line streams measured over 27,000 kilometers. And the green floodplains were well over 1 million hectares of connected floodplains and shallow lakes and I emphasize connected. This map shows the currently accessible streams. Because of numerous dams for water storage, hydropower, and irrigation diversion, the, the historic habitat has been reduced to about 7% of its historic amount. But in addition to numerous dams, diversions, and other longitudinal barriers, there is a comprehensive flood control system that disconnects rivers from their historic floodplains. And the loss of floodplain habitat is even greater. There's approximately only 1% of historic floodplain habitat currently connected to the river. And those connections are highly modified due to levees, weirs, bank revetments, and flow regulation. So channel and floodplain disconnections are relatively recent events in the US, which is why we have some good documentation. But those of you in the old world have several centuries of similar disconnections on the land. So how are floodplains important to salmon? Relatively new findings from California in three settings, the Sacramento River, an irrigation canal right next to it, and an adjacent floodplain show marked differences in food availability. Uh, this, quiet, this coupled with studies of some underutilization of floodplain habitats on the Sacramento River show that growth rates are significantly greater because of the abundant protein and fat rich food. The abundance of fish is also much greater because of vast space, which is combined with the abundant food resources. Floodplain food webs and salmon rearing are hot topics in salmon research. This Google Scholar query I did just last week of peer reviewed journal articles on salmon plus floodplain in the title shows that the number has exploded in the last 20 years. Already in the first half of 2021, there are over 2,000 new papers. So as a geomorphologist working on river restoration to support salmon recovery, I became increasingly aware that the way restoration projects were typically conceptualized was holding back floodplain restoration. Channel conveyance capacity is a common design parameter used in river restoration and common design practices assume a single thread channel conveying the 1.5 to two year flow with floodplain connection beginning at that elevation. I teamed up with Colin Thorne from the University of Nottingham to write a paper that we hoped would bring more attention to the floodplains that rivers occupied, instead of just focusing on river channels and channel improvements. In our paper, we built upon the channel evolution model that had been used successfully for four decades to help explain channel changes due to disturbance. 
The channel evolution model's starting point was a single thread channel in dynamic equilibrium or stability. The disturbance occurs a disturbance occurs that causes bed erosion, such as straightening or riparian clearing, base level lowering, increased runoff, dam building, and that triggers incision, which is their phase two. And after phase three, widening of the banks have relaxed into phase four and deposition on the bed sets up an inset floodplain and a riparian fringe develops inside the channel trench. Phase five, which is a new lower relatively stable condition is the end point in their model. This evolution can be observed at a location over decade to century timescales. The evolution can also be observed along the channel, and this allows the substitution of space for time, which is a useful tool for understanding site history and for predicting future channel changes at a site. So our model added an incised but stable 3S, which is very common and often the result of former restoration work. The S is for stability incised but stable and a successor stage seven from the literature then we added a fully evolved stage eight because given time stage seven can evolve further and we added a truly truly pre-disturbance stage that we called stage zero that's where the term comes from we simply backed up one from stage one so stages zero and eight have a network of small channels and even no channel at all in some settings. The anastomosing term means a network of islands and channels interacting with and moderated by vegetation. We represent the evolution in a cycle rather than a linear process because the cycle can repeat and often does in highly disturbed valleys. We also show that evolution can stop and reverse. Therefore, there are multiple pathways to channel evolution. This resulted in a more complete model that includes floodplain processes and connectivity. However, these sketches are not drawn to scale, and I'll try to explain the scale of these different stages in the next few slides. Using this largely undisturbed valley in the Sawtooth Mountains of Idaho, where it is too high and too cold for farming, I can explain the scale differences. Most or all of the alluvial valley is connected in the stage zero condition and for long durations. And that's key to the definition of stage zero. In stage two, the channelized condition, which is very common in developed valleys, stage two channels are often found tucked along one side of the valley to maximize land. And that was done so long ago that most people don't realize it was uh, an anthropogenic intervention. And that's here in the States. So I imagine it's even you know, more out of your memory in the old world. It has a narrow riparian belt and the valley is disconnected except during large floods. Stages three through six, the incised and widening stages also have high channel capacity. So the valley is dry and the floodplain is disconnected except during large floods. There may be remnant floodplain channels that are seasonally wet. Stage eight, developed as incision and widening progressed through the complete cycle is simply a scaled down version of the former stage zero. It is within the valley at a lower elevation in a trench in the alluvium. It has many of the same attributes and habitat, but it is smaller. We then linked each of the stream evolution model stages to habitat and ecosystem benefits using literature and the principle of functional ecology, which is that the potential for a stream to support large, rich, diverse and resilient ecosystems increases with scale, morphological diversity, and hydro period. We found 26 hydrogeomorphic attributes and 11 habitat and ecosystem benefits attributes that could be scaled to each of the stages through a simple scoring scheme. So on our geomorphic template, we overlaid the ecosystem functions. And here the size of bubbles represents the proportion of functional benefits and the number of colors represent the attributes. Notice the large color for bubbles. These are the floodplain connected stages. The small bubbles are the high capacity and in size channel, uh, single thread channel stages. When we plot the hydrogeomorphic attributes against the habitat and ecosystem benefits, we notice that there are two groups of points in this plot. Fundamentally, they have different attributes and benefits related to floodplain processes and connectivity. In the lower corner are all the single thread channels 
with infrequent connectivity to their alluvial valley. In the upper corner are the highly floodplain connected and small capacity channels. The stream evolution model pointed out that the standard practice of stabilizing incised or widening stages of channels is often counterproductive to restoration because it slows or stops the natural processes that can lead to more productive stages. It also pointed out that building habitat enhancement features in incised stages is an inadequate restoration target. So now I want to share with you two examples. of restoration projects that were designed to immediately deliver stage zero conditions. The first one is Weiches Creek in Oregon, which flows into the Deschutes River near Bend, Oregon. It's a high desert watershed with snow melt and rain and snow hydrology. And there are multiple small semi-confined alluvial valleys along the length of this volcanic um, terrain. Site conditions pre-project are shown on the left here. Um, there was a cobble berm that had been pushed up to confine the channel following the 1964 flood of record in this area. This was a common river management approach at that time. This was a stage 3S channel, incised and stabilized. Basically, the restoration pushed the berm back into the channel and graded additional high ground nearby to fill the channel, creating an instant stage zero setting. The photo shows the same location one year and two years after implementation. Another pre-project image, the single channel was more than three meters in size, and there had been boulder revetments placed on both banks. Notice this blue circle. In this next image, the blue circle is from approximately the same location. The boulder revetment is buried under gravel. Notice the greatly reduced particle size in general. And the elevated groundwater supports a vibrant successional riparian vegetation community at the new surface. And that's because the water table was raised. The water table monitoring data shows that the hyperique zone was fully charged within less than two weeks after project completion, bringing the water table up four feet to intersect the surface. And that happened even during late August, despite low stream flow. So my contribution to this project was um, I was able to estimate habitat delivery by applying two-dimensional hydraulic modeling to this project because there was LIDAR digital elevation models collected before and after the project was implemented. There's also a nearby flow gauge with a lengthy record, and that allowed me to model a range of flows spanning from common summer base flow to the 100-year flow. There are many more images than I can show you, so we'll quickly look at a few pairs of model output. On the left, in each of these next several images, is the pre-project velocity field, and on the right is the post-project velocity field. The velocity scale is in the lower right, where blue is less than one foot per second, and red is up to two feet per second. I display this range because I use it later to quantify suitable rearing area. These results shown here in this, in this image are for a winter base flow with recurrence interval of less than one year. Notice that flow is entirely confined to the single thread channel in the pre-project, but there's a network of channels that are active in the post-project. This little bit higher flow with recurrence interval of 1.65 years is a common small winter storm flow. Notice that most of the pre-project channel is still confined to a single thread channel and the velocity is getting into the orange and red range. It's getting relatively fast. There are a couple of small overflow channels that are just becoming connected. The post-project condition has a much larger watered area, a network of channels, and much lower velocities. The pattern continues as flow increases. This is the uh, 2.35 recurrence interval. And at the three-year recurrence interval flow, the pre-project channel remains largely confined to single thread channel and the velocities exceed two foot per second or they're off the scale. While there's an ever expanding wetted area with diverse flow velocities that are present in the post project. So this is the hundred year flow. It's not particularly relevant uh, to fish because there are such rare events, um, but you can still see um, that the post project um, still has very large suitable habitat area. All right, so let's, com let's uh, compile these results. I modeled many more flows, flow levels than I've been able to show you here today in order to create these curves of habitat versus discharge. 
This graph shows how rearing habitat relates to discharge, where the blue line is the pre-project and the orange line is the post-project results. If we zoom in on the period where 90% of the flows occur, you'll notice how the pre-project, the blue line, loses rearing area as common winter flows occur between 50 and 150 CFS. This supports a claim I've heard from many biologists throughout my career that juveniles are flushed downstream during winter storms. This kind of analysis allows you to create the habitat versus flow relationship, which you can then integrate that relationship over any hydrograph you're interested in. It can be a past hydrograph or it can be a future hydrograph if your concerns are about flow regulation or climate change. Here I've evaluated the 2016 normal water year. It had one approximately two year event and several one to one and a half year events over the winter, spring and early summer. The bottom graph is the daily time series of suitable rearing habitat for the pre-project condition. It's subtle, but the floods actually depress the rearing habitat area. There is less habitat throughout winter and early spring when new fry are emerging than during late summer and fall. The base habitat area hovers around 3,200 square meters in the pre-project condition. So using the same water year, I've added the post-project suitable habitat time series. And you have to change the scale by an order of magnitude to plot the pre-project and post-project habitat on the same graph. You'll notice that the rearing habitat is sustained throughout the winter flood events in the post-project condition, even increasing during each peak, with a base habitat area hovering around 60,000 square meters. That's 20 times uh, the former condition. Second project example I'm going to share with you is the South Fork McKenzie River. This example is courtesy of Kate Meyer from Willamette National Forest. The lower South Fork sits in a broad alluvial valley about one mile wide that, shares, that it shares with the McKenzie River for a couple of miles. Although once a complex connected anastomosing system, both the McKenzie and South Fork have been sized up to 14 feet and simplified down to single thread channels due to the dam, less a long history of berming, ditching and draining out wetlands and side channels in order to log massive cedar trees on the river and floodplain. The South Fork was once the most important tributary for spring Chinook salmon and bull trout production in the Willamette River Basin. And now there's a major lack of spawning, rearing, foraging, overwintering habitat for native fishes. The U.S. Forest Service completed a valley reset stage zero design for the full four mile stretch below Cougar Dam at about 600 acres of valley bottom. They are implementing the project in phases, starting at the confluence and moving upstream. They've completed phase one and phase two in 2018 and 2019 for a total of about 150 acres so far. Their design uses the geomorphic grade line relative elevation model method devised by Powers and others published in 2018. I'll give you that reference at the end for determining target elevations for a valley segment. They collected bathymetric LIDAR, ran their terrain model, and conducted a lot of field verification to adjust the grading plan to best reactivate remnant channels and determine the cut and fill quantities for contracting. On the grading, they add wood at about 30 pieces per acre, and they add a lot more small wood because it's available from the on-site clearing. Several implementation photographs coming up here. For in both phases, they start by diverting the entire river into a constructed channel that bypasses the project area, leaving the dewatered channel dry for filling. Dewatering gives you a great look at just how habitat for the incised channel really is. It's definitely just a boulder ditch. Then they conduct extensive fish salvage and relocation in the dewatered channel. The cut zones are cleared of vegetation and lowered to their design elevation. The photo on the right is a cut zone that is ready for wood placement. The cut and fill zones are left rough as undulating surfaces, and they do not construct channels. They let the river revolve on its own, interacting with wood and vegetation. In the fill areas, where they fill the incised channel primarily, they use uh, mixed alluvium from the floodplain, and they don't sort it.
For wood placement, they take a very messy, unengineered approach. There's about 30% of the wood is buried. Some of the wood is expected to move around and rack up on more and create more complex, stable log jams, but very little wood is expected to move out of the project area because the energy is taken out of this new broad flow field. So a couple of uh, photographs of, of uh, winter flows, high flows in the reach just immediately upstream at 2,000 and 4,000 CFS for you to compare to this next image, which is in the implemented stage zero reach at 3,000 CFS. And the difference in, in habitat is really like night and day everywhere in the post project there is mellow habitat whereas in the um, pre pre project image there's probably uh, no habitat for juveniles in in that wetted area so on wetted area some of the results coming out of this project are there's there is a robust monitoring program for the project but since it's only been a couple of years they just have some preliminary modeling monitoring results to share so far from a wetted area perspective, though, the project immediately resulted in an expanded base flow wetted area of about 56 acres, a fourfold increase. And they have five valley-wide monitoring transects from which biological data are collected both pre and post project. Spawning habitat was one of their goals. There was a maximum of four reds found in this reach during decades prior to the project. That compared to about 200 Chinook reds within the project area found in 19 uh, 2019 and 2020. And note also that 70 to 90% of those reds are located within the direct disturbance areas where they did cut or fill. They're looking at macro vertebrates, which they've been uh, collected data two years prior to restoration and one year post restoration so far. The orange represents total abundance and there's a seven fold increase as soon as two months following implementation. The green represents taxa richness, which is a measure of diversity. There was a 33% decline in richness uh, after two months or two months after construction. That's followed by a 56% increase one year later. Fish density and abundance from um, pre and post projects, snorkel surveys, they see a five fold increase in fish density at transects. And when you extrapolate that transect observations to the wetted area, you come up with an estimated 30 times more fish in the same valley length. Growth rate and fish condition uh, look very promising. Hook and line snorkel surveys show high juvenile Chinook growth rates. These are nine inch juvenile Chinook. The Forest Service is currently undertaking a juvenile Chinook study with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, but they haven't collected enough data to share any of it yet. Yeah. Uh, Brian, I yes. almost all done. I have only uh, three sides left. Thank you very much. So one of the attributes of stage zero or high floodplain connectivity is supposed to be resilience to wildfire. And the South Fork project got to test that idea in 2020 during Oregon's worst fire season on record. In under 36 hours, more than 150,000 acres burned. The map on the bottom right shows the fire area within the McKenzie River sub basin those areas in red have over 75% vegetation mortality. This was a very fast moving hot fire that consumed nearly everything in its path. The South Fork project area, which I've just shown you, was right at where that star is at the head of this burned area. Kate was on the fire crew and she stopped by the South Fork project a couple of times during the event. Some observations from Kate, I'll just quote her here. In contrast to what I had been seeing elsewhere, it looked like an oasis. It was the only place where we actually saw and heard birds for weeks to come. And Chinook continued to spawn unfazed for the duration of the fire. And this is what that project looks like this spring, six months post fire. So I'm wrapping up here and, and I'm gonna use the salmon life cycle to, to try to bring some context to this. So the simple math of salmon life cycle transition survival rates lets us put the habitat connectivity issue into a population context which we need to guide effective restoration. This simple model is for unimpaired conditions. Reality is most salmon die at every transition. So a large salmon population depends on a strong foundation. 
and a strong foundation requires functional habitat for the first two or three life stages. The main problems with disconnected floodplains are that high capacity channels reduce egg survival rate, perhaps down to zero in some settings, and juvenile rearing habitat is small and food poor, therefore depressing that life stage as well. These two effects from the same disconnection problem depress the first two life stages of salmon. There's also evidence that the size of ocean entry is directly related to adult return rate. Bigger fish have higher survival. Mathematically, the die is already cast. Without reliable connectivity to large and resilient floodplain habitat, the population stays small. So in summary, lateral connectivity to floodplains supports biodiversity, including large salmon populations. Restoration practices are beginning to get out of the channel and connect laterally to off-channel and large floodplain habitat, and the early results look promising. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Brian, for your uh, interesting uh, pr presentation. And I completely agree that uh, for uh, river restoration, we have to look uh, beyond the channel. Um, there's room uh, for one question uh, and here Ruben here besides me is looking at the Q&A whether there are any questions. Uh, Ruben do you have a question for Brian? All right um, so thanks for the talk and hi Speaking. from me. Um, we do have questions uh, there will be one we have time for one and um, this concerns the lateral connectivity um, that's benefiting from barrier removal. So the removal of transversal barriers uh, do not only reestablish longitudinal con connectivity and, and vertical connectivity and temporal connectivity, but also lateral connectivity. And we would like to know why. Brian, when was the question clear for you? <laughs> uh, can, can you parse that down? The, the last part really stumped me. Whether dam, dam removal also, also improves the lateral, lateral connectivity with, uh, uh, between, with yeah. the channel and the floodplains. Yeah, I, I think perhaps there's you know a little bit of uh, cultural difference here. The dams that, that we've been removing in the U.S. are, are uh, primarily uh, they're in canyons, right? And so they open up connectivity to more canyon habitat in general, and. I noticed from your introductory talk, uh, your introductory speaker, that, that uh, you're talking about dams uh, in the Netherlands on huge floodplains and estuaries. So you already are uh, working in that lateral dimension when you're looking at dams uh, like those. Okay. Okay, thank you, Brian. Thank you very much uh, for giving this, this first opening presentation at the, at, at the conference. I do, did find it a very interesting presentation and also saw compliments for you in the, in the chat. Um, now we move sure. to uh, an interview that is for something uh, different. And um, the interview will be with uh, Dr. Philip Harrison, who is a research associate at Canadian Rivers Institute at the University of New Brunswick. He works on fish passage project on the St. John River within the Mactaquac, he may tell me how to pronounce that because I'm not sure, Aquatic Ecosystem Study, MACE team from the Canadian Rivers Institute. One of Philip's research focuses on the interaction between fish, fish and hydropower. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, yeah, you got the video too. Okay. okay. Um, this, is, this, this is new. We have to see how this works for a second. Oh, yeah. It, it's a little windy here. The wind just picked up a second ago, of course. <laughs> I'll try and mask my phone. So you, you are renewing a, a, a dam and you try to improve fish migration. Can you say a few words about that? To 
Yes, yeah, so the Mactaquac Dam, uh, the lifespan of the dam has been significantly reduced because there's a concrete uh, alkali ag aggregate reaction, which means that the uh, concrete is expanding. So the expected lifetime of around 100 years has been reduced to, uh, to 40 years. So, so that the time for the renewal of this dam has, uh, has is, is coming fairly soon. So this offers, offers uh, opportunity to design uh, fish passage facilities and improve fish passage facilities for future uh, for a future potential uh, refit. And uh, with whom do you you co cooperate in with this project? With with organisations are you involved to? assess these pos possibilities to combine fish passage and hydropower? Uh, I work for uh, Canadian Rivers Institute uh, on the Mactaquac Aquatic Ecosystem Study. So it's a, uh, a long-term study, 20-year uh, lifetime study. Uh, and it's funded by NSERC and also funded by the Hydropower uh, New Brunswick Power. And uh, yeah, you can see the the dam in the background uh, up here. He's, uh, and we're actually standing on the, on the fish passage facility uh, at the moment, which is immediately the tail race of the dam. A lot of local interest, or is it is it national interest to this uh, the project? How are the local people connected to your project? Uh, well, we work with uh, First Nations partners too, and uh, we work for a uh, uh, university, so uh, our, our, you know, it's scientific research, but uh, all of our, our research is uh, related to that community, definitely. Yes. Okay, I, I couldn't completely hear your answer due to the wind and in your mic microphone. Okay, I'm turning around this way, yeah, it's suddenly. Always when you're in the field, you expect the unexpected and it suddenly became very windy. <laughs> but, yes. But yes, yeah, we work with uh, the local regulatory uh, agency, which is Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And uh, these guys are the guys that actually operate the, uh, the fish passage facility here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we work with uh, NB Power, which is a uh, government uh, crown corporation. So they're uh, a public corporation too. And then we're involved with uh, many uh, First Nations and uh, conservation groups in the area. Okay. I can hear you much better now. Uh, that is okay. Uh, that I'll is stay good, facing very this good, way. Uh, Philip. Okay. That is. Thanks. Um, uh, how many diff different fish species uh, use this fish? Species? Is it only a single species or are it multiple species that use it? We have uh, 52 species here in the Lower wow. St. John River. But uh, the, the fishway itself is actually only uh, the upstream fishway is uh, is used just for three species: Atlantic salmon, uh, blueback herring, and uh, uh, Atlantic alewife. It's currently operated for just uh, particularly for those three species: the, the alewife and the blueback, uh, known collectively as Gasparo. Each year, uh, we, we get a very large run here in the St. John River. And around 2 million, uh, I think this year, around 2 million fish have been uh, uh, moved through the fishway uh, into the hopper and then trucked upstream. And I think if I turn around here, you can see the, uh, you just see the uh, hopper up there. Mm -hmm. And you can see the entrance to the, uh, to the fishway uh, down here. You can, uh, hopefully you can see that. That's one of the entrances to the fishway. And uh, hopefully you can see our, our uh, just look at the fishway. Uh, hopefully you can see one of our pit antenna arrays that we have uh, set up on the fishway just w within the gate there. I don't know if it's good enough uh, for you to see. Where can you, but, can yeah. you pinpoint it? Where it is it at the... Uh, so okay. there's an entrance to the fishway and then you can see there's a plastic tubing that goes around. That's a large uh, 20 foot uh, pit antenna. Uh, so we tag 6,000 fish over the last two years uh, downstream of here. And then uh, when fish sw swim into the fishway, we can detect them at that uh, antenna uh, over there. And then uh, there's multiple gates. Uh, there's five gates down there for entrances to the fishway. And then fish swim 
up through the fishway and uh, under here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just walking across. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they turn back round. And then if you uh, if you hopefully you can see down there, you can see another one of our antennas, yes, which I is can at see the, it. Yes. the uh, the entrance to the uh, crowding pool. So we can use these antennas to determine the uh, passage efficiency and attraction efficiency of the uh, of the fishway. Although the fishway has been operated for uh, since the, since 1976, I, I believe uh, this is really the first study that's actually looked at the efficiency of the fishway. In the past, that the they know how many fish they move upstream, but we but previously didn't know uh, what proportion of fish uh, that arrive at the dam actually make it into the fishway. Mm -hmm. And it, it, in, in the fishway down there now, I don't know if you can actually see, but there's uh, there's tons of Gasparo uh, swimming around down there. Oh, yeah, there. yeah, 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 yeah. Right yeah. now, you can see them down there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so our, our plan is to, um, to use this pit tagging array in, in addition to some other studies, including our fine scale telemetry studies, to, uh, to see how well this fishway is working now and uh, look at the influence of, uh, of hydropower operations. So uh, the turbines flows, you can see come down here that there's just uh, one turbine on at the moment. But we're, we're interested to see uh, the, the, the influence of these turbine flows on, uh, on attraction and, and movement into the fishway. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, th thank you, Phil Philip. Uh, no this is very interesting, but uh, it's a short interview. So I, yes. have, I, have, I, have to, I have to stop. stop it. But it's really good to, to, to see things live also d during this, this webinar. So okay. uh, th thank you very, very much for your explanation, explanation and, and all the success with, with your work. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thanks, bye. Cheers. What's next? Okay. Now... <clears throat> so, um, a webinar this webinar would not have been possible without uh, sponsors. So now we will have a small, a small break to show you more about the sponsors of the Fish Passage uh, 2021 webinar. Let's hear what the sponsors have to tell us. The sound? I, I don't hear anything. Yeah, um, we have a small uh, technical uh, problem at this moment.
It's well known that man-made structures on rivers can impede the movement and migration of fish. So studying how fish behave around dams and other facilities is vital to understanding the impact of these structures. However, these studies are extremely challenging and complex. That's where InnovaSea comes in. Using our innovative fish tracking technology, our experts can handle every aspect of a research project to help companies meet their regulatory requirements. Get in touch with us today to learn more. Eel is a species synonymous with our inland waterways, yet numbers have decreased drastically. Fish migration is crucial for the life cycle of eel. We have developed a monitoring device for glass eels and elfers called Elfi. Elfi has already proven itself as a successful monitoring device at more than 35 locations. Monitoring with Elfi is cost efficient and active 24 7. This standardized monitoring enables identification of trends and changes. <laughs> Okay, we are back, back, back again. Uh, apologies for the small hiccups. It's the first day, but we will uh, share everything with you and it will perhaps take the, to the, take the program to last a few minutes extra. But I hope you understand and uh, we will improve during the course. We will go to our next presentation, which will be given by Dr. Anne Schaefer, who is executive director and lead scientist of the Coastal Watershed Institute, a small place-based environmental nonprofit dedicated to understanding, protecting, and restoring coastal ecosystems through community-led scientific partnerships. They conduct world-class coastal ecosystem science, conservation, and restoration with very modest resources and a remote base of operations. Their focus is on nearshore response to large-scale dam removals and kelp bed ecosystem function for forage fish. Anne has been investigating the evolution and progress of the eroded Elwa Delta and its fast recovery since the two biggest dam removals in the United States. The title of her presentation is Shoreline Air Armor Removal Fulfills Nearshore Ecosystem Restoration Following Large-Scale Dam Removal, Elwa Near Shore. Anna, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm sharing my screen. And now I'll make sure I'm in presentation mode. So can everybody see my talk? Yes, yes I can. Okay. Very good. OK, well, thank you uh, for your interest in our work documenting the relationship between shoreline armoring and uh, large scale dam removals to promote nearshore ecosystem restoration. And the theme of this uh, webinar is global or our global solutions for river connectivity issues. And um, I'm here to represent that the nearshore is the connective tissue that links our oceans with our rivers. Um, and our coastal systems matter. They're being lost and they're being lost at an unprecedented rate. So just some metrics for you, 65% of the world's nearshore seagrass and wetland habitats have been lost and over 90% of formerly important species that have been associated with those habitats have also been depleted. And anthropogenic uh, forces have been um, identified as the reason for these losses. This is by Cooper and Pilkey in 2014. And here's just a one graph snapshot of exactly what uh, we're trying to illustrate. This is a graph from Lots et al. in 2006, and it illustrates the loss in the relative abundance of important habitats 
um, post-colonial development. And so you can see how precipitously the relative abundance of these habitat types in uh, near shore and estuary plummeted in recent past decades. And it's important to also note this inflection point right here, which is where we started actually restoring ecosystems. So we're maybe turning the trend around. It's not as uh, rebounding as quickly as we'd like, but at least we're headed in the right direction. And here are one of the sentinel uh, species for why in the Northeast Pacific, we are so focused on these nearshore systems, which are globally uh, important for both humans and marine life. These are uh, outmigrating salmon along the near shore. So the near shore and coastal zones in large contexts are um, driven by sediment and formed by sediment processes. And these processes are both fluvial and coastal hydrodynamics. And combined, those make the near shore. So there, here's a graph of uh, the near shore zone and extent from the area of tidal influence in lower rivers out to a photic depth of 30 meters mean low, low water. We also have a lateral component to near shore that we um, define as drift cells. And these are uh, reaches of shoreline that we use to discuss and quantify uh, the sediment delivery along our shoreline. So dams have, and large scale dams in particular, have a number of uh, very significant impacts to marine systems. Um, again, sediment disruption and disruption of sediment delivery is top of the list, as well as disruption of the delivery of wood to coastal areas. Um, a whole suite of water quality declines occur uh, in coastal systems associated with large scale dams. Um, and then a suite of loss of habitats, including uh, degradation of beaches, uh, disruptions in kelp distributions, and these in turn will result in disrupting trophic cascades and then um, also be or, uh, expressed in loss in fishery resources. So, so not surprising uh, to anybody, dam removals are becoming an increasingly important tool for our ecosystem restoration. And in the United States, the average, dam, average age of dams is 58 years, almost 60 years now. So um, as these dams outlive their uh, intended life, um, removing them is becoming more and more important. This is a graph that illustrates the welcome trend in the removal of dams in the United States. So we're, we're happy to see this and want to see this uh, continue. So for these dam removal projects, the watershed ecosystem restoration associated with the dam removals have been the focus of much effort. But the nearshore ecosystem restoration from dam removals has been largely understudied. And so that's where we have focused much of our efforts. And uh, we are located in the northwest corner of the United States, and our work has focused on the Elwha River. And the Elwha River is located on the northwest corner of Washington State, and it is um, in the Olympic National Park. And so the majority of the river, yeah, the river has uh, federal environmental protection. And the dam removals uh, in the Elwha are the largest dam removals that have occurred to date in the world. The other important component of the Elwha is that it actually is along the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And the Strait of Juan de Fuca is the uh, connecting corridor between the inland waters of the Salish Sea for the United States and British Columbia, as well as the Pacific Ocean. So it's a very important corridor for migration. So here are the two dams um, they, and where they were located within the Elwha watershed. They're both large scale uh, and both installed at the turn of the century or just about. Um, the one slide snapshot of the impact of these dams to the fishery resources in the watershed, uh, pretty much catastrophic. There were a number of salmon species in the river that were just about extirpated with these two dams. 
And here's the Elwha near shore. So the near shore for the Elwha is quite large. It includes an embayed shoreline that has no shoreline armoring. This is Freshwater Bay. Here's the Elwha River and associated Delta Estuary and Lower River. Here are the feeder bluffs of the Elwha Drift Cell and then the spit in the distal. So we focus on fish as a metric to understand how the nearshore ecosystems are working. And there are a few species that are really useful for doing this. Um, a couple of species of forage fish uh, are very helpful. Um, and so two in particular are surf smelt and sand lance. And these are pelagic schooling fish that live out in the ocean, but seasonally they'll come in and spawn on very specific grain size in intertidal beaches, along intertidal beaches. So surf smelt like a larger gravel sand mix and for our region spawn in summer. And they spawn a little further up on the beach. Sand lance in turn uh, spawn in winter and they spawn a little further down on the shoreline. So here's just a visual illustration of what those eggs look like. And again, remember these fish have very, are very specific about the grain size for spawning. If the substrate isn't that they need for their spawning isn't available, they won't spawn. And so we can use them as a really clear indicator of how uh, degraded nearshore is translated to ecosystem function. And so in this graph, you can see the Elwha drift cell, which is severely sediment uh, starved both from the in river dams and significant and associated shoreline armoring. And look at the forage fish uh, distribution, spawning distribution relative to a comparative drift cell that um, has very little shoreline armoring and no in river dams. And so, just visually, you can see how much more log scale more uh, forage fish spawning occurs in unaltered near shore systems and the role that both dam removals and shoreline armoring play in disrupting this important ecosystem function. Another uh, area of interest is, of course, the estuary. This is the Elwha River mouth uh, in the 1950s, so you know, some 50 years after the dams had been installed. And you can see that it's not one river mouth, but two. It's very heavily vegetated. It's quite stable, um, and there's this persistent bar uh, along the the mouth. This is the same delta in 2010, right before the dam removal started. And you can see it's very much reduced. There's only one very incised channel. Um, the delta is much reduced. There are persistent water quality problems associated with the remaining uh, features. So a very degraded estuary. So the dam removals in the Elwha began in 2011 and the majority of the work ended in 2014. And it's really important to note as we have this conversation that none of this would have occurred without the uh, lower Elwha Klallam tribe who uh, have their usual and accustomed area in the Elwha watershed and are central to the river and its ecosystem. So here are the two uh, sites before and after Elwha and Glines Canyon dams. So between the two dams, there was about 21 million cubic meters of material stored behind the two dams. And of that approximately half was predicted to be delivered to the near shore. And that was predicted to have occurred within five years of dam removal. And here's just a one slide snapshot to give you a visual of the size and the scale of the project that we're talking about. It was pretty remarkable. So this is what a near shore looks like when you have that scale of a ecosystem restoration in an associated watershed. This is the Elwha Delta in 2015, I believe. And up in the upper right hand corner, I have the same Delta in 2009. So you can see how quickly and how dramatically the Delta changed. And we had a quick mapping exercise and documented that at the um, initiation of the dam removals, the delta was at its smallest aerial extent. Excuse me, and by 2015, it was at its largest, at about 157 hectares. So, um, looking at 
the near shore response, this is that freshwater bay shoreline just to the west of the river mouth that has no shoreline armory. This is in 2007, well before the dams came out. <clears throat> this is that same beach in 2013. So you can see um, how broad and fine and um, flattened and softened the beach became really rapidly after the dam removals began. Also notice the high volume of wood. Um, and these conditions persist even almost a decade later now. But we didn't see that same level of transformation in all the regions of the Elwha near shore. And um, in USGS in 2000, I believe this is 2013, generated a heat map to illustrate the deposition and elevation changes associated with the sediment in the coastal system. And so here's the freshwater bay area, here's the river, and here's the rest of the delta. <clears throat> and you can see that the majority of the delta had very um, dramatic deposition, but there were areas along uh, the eastern delta in particular that continued to uh, erode. And so our biologist, restoration biologist, Jamie Michelle, went in a workshop that Siwi was uh, sponsoring, put overlaid the uh, riprap distribution with this heat map and um, illustrated immediately the role that the shoreline armoring was playing in disrupting sediment distribution to this reach of the Elwha Delta. And this just gives you another uh, visual of the extent of where the riprap or shoreline armoring was. So in 2016, uh, we generated a couple large grant uh, funding sources and pulled just about 7,000 cubic meters of uh, large riprap or shoreline armoring uh, from almost a mile of the Elwha River East Delta. So this is what the site looked like well before the project started in 2015. And this is what the same site looked like literally within a week of doing the work. So um, a pretty remarkable response in a really remarkable time period. We of course have a number of metrics that we've been monitoring associated with both the dam removals and the shoreline armoring removals. I'm only gonna touch on a few of these just to illustrate what we've seen. So again, just for orientation, here's the Elwha Drift Cell again. Freshwater Bay is the shoreline <clears throat> that just received the dam removal sediment. There was no shoreline armoring in Freshwater Bay. The Elwha River Mouth and Delta, uh, West Delta in particular, the East Delta, which is where all the shoreline armoring was removed. So here are just some illustrative uh, graphs. These are the vertical elevations of the site. Uh, this is Freshwater Bay. And all of these will have two dates. They'll be uh, the pre, um, well actually on all of these graphs are going to be well after the dam removal ended. So 2016 and 2018 are the two uh, years that are provided here. And so you can see um, by the difference between 2016 and 2018 for Freshwater Bay for the vertical elevation, there really isn't that much of a change. The site does continue to broaden and flatten. It, it, there is some variability depending on where you are on the horizontal distance on the beach. But in general, the, the transition seems to be um, not that dramatic now, uh, four years after, eight years after dam removal. Um, this is the area where we actually removed the shoreline armory. And again, you can see this pretty immediate uh, transformation. The armoring was removed in 2000, uh, excuse me, the armoring was removed in 2016. And so here you can see in 2018, the beach almost immediately grew and widened and flattened. What surprised us was how far down uh, the beach we saw this translation and change. This uh, is unarmored shoreline that was uh, actually outside of the actual project area. And this is one of the areas we actually saw the most dramatic change in the beaches after we did this shoreline armoring removal. And by calculations, back then napping calculations, we estimate that removing about 7,600 cubic meters of armor resulted in about 46,000 cubic meters of natural beach replenishment. 
and just to give you another visual, this uh, wasn't limited to just immediately adjacent to where we did the restoration, but uh, almost six kilometers away, we saw this same transformation. <clears throat> and again, just giving you an illustration of the volumes of the change in vertical elevation of the beaches once we pulled that shoreline armory. So removing riprap from a shoreline can have uh, long uh, effects that may be uh, quite a long distance from the actual project site. So our questions for our ecological monitoring uh, included, um, what is the nearshore ecological response to both dam removal and shoreline armoring removal? And then how does the shoreline nearshore response um, compare to the response of that just associated with dam removal? And then what are the relationships between the responses of the two restoration actions? So again, I'm just gonna uh, provide one set of data. These are graphs for the um, beach rack. And beach rack is that detached seaweed that uh, will deposit along shorelines seasonally. And it's a very important resource for invertebrates that are in turn used for food for uh, migrating shorebirds, as well as a very important resource for migrating salmon. So the gray, the dark gray is 2016. The beige or light gray is 2018. And uh, we looked at, and I'll illustrate three areas. The first again is that freshwater bay where we only had the dam removal sediment. There was no shoreline armoring removed. And again, this is after dam removal ended. So you'll see along that shoreline over those, the two year period between 2016 and 2018, we did see an increase in the beach rack uh, cover at Freshwater Bay. Um, looking at the site where we actually removed the shoreline armoring, we noted that when we, before we started the shoreline armoring, the beach rack distribution um, and cover was much lower than at Freshwater Bay, the area that had no shoreline armoring. We removed the shoreline armoring and uh, saw this same trend in increase in cover at the restored site two years after we removed the armoring. However, we didn't see those same trends at our control area. And in fact, we saw just the opposite. <clears throat> Looking at our invertebrate uh, populations in these beach rack communities, we uh, confirmed again that both, as with the previous uh, graph, that both the dam removal and the um, riprap removal have important roles to play in um, the near shore ecosystem. And in fact, that every element of both the dam removals and the shoreline restoration actions were significant in restoring the Elwha near shore. Okay, so let's uh, move quickly to the surf smelt spawning. These are gonna be a series of illustrations of the distribution of, of surf smelt yeah. along the Elwha cell. And I'm sorry, uh, surf smelt eggs. And are just the eggs. Yep. Uh, could you uh, round up more or less? Yep. Okay. So here we go. Um, these are the distribution of the eggs prior to the dam removal. This is during the dam removal. And then after we pulled that riprap. And so you can see that uh, once we pulled that shoreline armoring, the distribution of the eggs in the Elwha drift cell extended dramatically. So in the nutshell then, Large-scale dam removal projects are sediment engine projects, and near shore is driven by sediment hydrodynamics. And large-scale dam removals provide significant relief along sediment-starved uh, shore sediment-starved shorelines. But if there are impairments along that shoreline, that relief is going to be incomplete. You can restore shorelines after you've pulled uh, out your large-scale dams, but you're going to be delayed in your ecosystem response. And as nearshore species and habitats are the corner, cornerstone of our coastal watershed ecosystems, it's critical, therefore, to not dam in the first place um, or armor shorelines. And um, when you're in the dam removal restoration context, make sure that you include your nearshore in full uh, consideration well before or at 
minimum concomitant with the dam removals. This is particularly relevant to Europe. And um, there's a new technique being developed in Holland that is coined a sediment engine, where large uh, deposition of sediment is tracked into the near shore, extremely expensive project. And the similarities in the visuals of uh, doing that versus the sediment delivered to near shore with the large scale dam removal are irrefutable. So here are a few of the references that I cited. Um, and again, thank you to the World Fish Migration uh, Foundation folks and all their incredible hard work to our continued uh, funders and collaborators, supporters. And I'll take any questions if you have them. Hi, Anne. Thank you very for this very nice uh, presentation. Uh, also, I like it particularly because river science and marine and coastal science of, quite often operate in different domains and they do not cooperate. And your presentation combined that, uh, uh, that two, the two domains. Uh, so very nice. Um, there's time for one question. Uh, Ruben, do you have a question for Anne? Yes, we indeed got a few questions in. Uh, before I ask the question, I need to um, remind the audience to always direct the questions in the question and answer section um, to the person you're addressing the question to. So, for example, name, question, right? Okay, so this is very important, otherwise we can't <coughs> assign it properly. Excuse me. So, the question uh, that we will hopefully get answered now is, does your nearshore restoration account for climate change that recognizes projected sea level rises that will affect new habitat? So is it, uh, it should be more of a properly considered resilience and rehabilitation project, much more than just a simple restoration? Um, we consider um, climate change in the context of resilience and um, we know, especially regionally, that the main uh, effect that we're going to see here from climate change is going to be our changes in our local wind patterns. And um, so we do try to incorporate that into our uh, strategic planning and research to the extent we can. But from our perspective, um, building resilience into our shorelines and making them as intact and functioning as possible will benefit um, not only for uh, the dam removals, but also from the larger uh, climate change context. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you Anne, for this very nice presentation. The, 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 the climate change is also um, about sediment loads, and I see a lot of sediment loads coming your, your Elwe River, so I think that can keep up quite a bit with, uh, with sea level rise. So thank you again for this very nice presentation, and we move to the next interview. The next interview will be with uh, Daniel Zelinski on the Great Lake Fishery uh, Commission in the United States. And the interesting thing is that he is building a fish passage which doesn't allow every fish to pass. So I'm very interested to hear what, how he's going to do that, that certain fish are allowed to pass while others are not. Daniel, welcome to the, uh, to the show. Yep, thank you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right, perfect. So, so did you hear my question, Daniel? Yeah, so, so Fish Pass really, you know, like you uh, summarize it pretty well, the mission of Fish Pass is to develop tools to be able to uh, allow for up and downstream passage of desired species while simultaneously blocking and or removing uh, undesirable species, and in this case, uh, invasive uh, sea lamprey. So, you know, it was, Fish Pass was really designed to be able to address the connectivity conundrum surrounding migratory barriers. So in cases where removal of a barrier is not you know, the best solution. Uh, and in this case, it's because of the presence of invasive species. And in the Great Lakes, uh, the invasive sea lamprey um, is, is certainly the primary driver for the project. Uh, since their introduction in the Great Lakes in the mid 19th century, uh, they contribute to okay. the extirpation of lake trout and lake whitefish. Right. And barriers are a big part of managing uh, their population. So 
those barriers also block many of our native fish. So being able to develop tools that selectively allow passage of our native species into high quality habitat uh, is certainly a, a major priority. Thank you. Can you say a few more words, how you're going to, uh, to, to see which fish are in your fish pass and then how are you going to remove the, one, the ones you don't like? How are you going to keep them out? Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so the facility is obviously, it's not constructed yet, but it will be located on, on the dam, Union Street Dam, uh, which is in Traverse City, Michigan, which is right behind me. Um, and essentially the, the facility will allow for about 10 years of research uh, to be able to integrate different technologies. And we're really driving, we're drawing a lot of uh, inspiration from the recycling industry, um, which may be an odd uh, analogy here, but really that's that's the best example we could find that uh, industry found a way to integrate a lot of different sorting technologies that target specific attributes of materials, or in this case, the attributes of the fish, whether it be their phenology, their biology, behavior, or their physiology, and being able to target individual attributes, be able to selective, selectively identify an individual uh, species that we want to pass while blocking those that we don't. So okay. really drawing upon you know, years of, of research into those individual technologies. And this is just the, the first opportunity where we'll be able to okay. test multiple at the same time. Okay. Uh, there there's must be somebody behind your camera. Can, can you give the, 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 the people in something like a 360 around shot a little bit where we are exactly and say a few words about the environment where we are. Yep, so, so what you'll see uh, in front of you right there is the Union Street Dam. Uh, so you've got the, a main embankment spillway and then on the side is a closed fishway. Uh, and that fishway is closed because there was another project, uh, the Boardman River Restoration Project removed all the other barriers that are upstream. So three dams have been removed. Um, so that fishway, potentially provided access from sea lamprey up into the system. So that's been closed um, in preparation for fish pass. And this is located in a, a relatively urban setting. You've got condos in the background. I've got a busy road right behind me as well. <laughs> yeah, okay. And is it, is it a very expensive, uh, expensive project, this fish pass, or uh, could it be, be a, a get into place in many places, or is it still very experimental in a pilot phase? Can you say a few words about that? Yeah, so the project we've received funding from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to, uh, to get going on this project, and it is about a $20 million facility, but it's not the facility that we intend to have exported. Um, we don't necessarily need to have a, a 400 foot long, 30 foot wide plume to be able to test this in each location. But it's really the process to be able to select the correct technologies and, and configure them in the right way uh, that can be exported to different sites. So each site is going to be a unique solution because you have a different suite of fish that are going to arrive uh, in each tributary or, or watershed. Um, so really, this is unique to this site. It's a one-of-a-kind facility, um, and, and it's really only possible with the great partnerships that we've had. Okay. And if I now go in... Uh, around that area and ask the people, do they know that you're busy with it, with this project? Yes, we, we've uh, had lots of public outreach and, and conversations with local stakeholders over the past four to five years, um, probably more than I can count at this point. Um, so we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of excitement surrounding the project. Um, it's right in the heart of downtown Traverse City. We'll, there'll be a lot of park features and, and improved access just to the river uh, in comparison to the existing site. So there's a lot of enthusiasm there. Okay. And, and when, when will the project be realized? Perhaps you said so, but I may, I may have missed it. Well, we've got a contractor uh, on board to do the, do the work, and we're hoping that within the, the year we'll be able to start construction on this. Oh, this is, this is very good. Okay, I think we have to, to close the interview at this, uh, this point and uh, wish you all the, the success with, with, with your work and uh, uh, in particular how, how good it can, can be to, to keep the sea, sea lampreys out and to get uh, the, speed, the desired species in. All right, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. <laughs> Okay, what's next on the program, uh, Ruben? The, the poll. So, so we're going to ask uh, 
the, the, the participants, we're going to ask them uh, a couple of questions. That is correct. Okay, uh, so and how can they see the questions? Yeah, so the way it works is um, you please go to menti.com and use the code that we just pasted into the chat window, 104-304-45 at menti.com. Okay. Um, at the same time, I will start the thing. Yeah, people always need a little bit of time to uh, yes. to enter the code, yeah, so we should give right. should give them a a, a minute and then. Uh, but you can post the first question already. Yes. Is that possible? I hope everyone sees my screen and the first question now. Okay. Um, I will read out the question or will you do that? Uh, do, I can you read do it, it out. Yeah, okay. yeah, do you do it? Well, That's the it. first question that we're interested in is what is your favorite measure to restore river connectivity? And the way the first question works is a word cloud. So um, phrases, words that uh, are reported more frequently than others are bigger than other words. So yeah. there's going to be a lot of words in the end, and the big ones are the ones that many people put in. So okay. we're looking forward to your input here. I see, I see only dam removal appearing. Dam removal is definitely uh, very big up here. Yeah, uh, I see fish pass. Dam removal in one word is also prominent. It's basically yeah. the same, of course. Riparian restoration. This is super oh, no, interesting. now it's going. Uh, oh, wow. So a lot of stuff coming in now. Yeah, Fish this is biomass. Good. Yes. Nice. Uh, we have okay. dike removal. We, I guess yeah. we can safely count that to barrier removal. removal. Bypass and guidance. Uh, these are track. also so always similar. There are similar words for, I think, the same, the yeah, same action is, that people would like to have. This is something we can't have, entirely yes, prevent, but which okay. is totally fine. This so is good. we have uh, yeah. barrier removal. Floodplain connection, obviously, that has to be there too. Yes. Biodiversity. Yeah. Weir removal. This is okay. also, of course, dam okay. removal in the way of sense. Uh, and we will come back to those uh, uh, later. Eh? Yes, when we're we actually going to discuss this, this yeah. with the presenters uh, uh, at, yeah. at the end. What is their opinion? Yeah, so we have 51 this? inputs, 52. Okay. And um, okay. we would like to discuss every uh, single one of these results with you later. But yeah. I think we need to move on to the question two, yes. if I'm right. Question, question two. I think the dam removal is absolutely it is, apparent uh, in yeah, the middle of the, the pivotal of the picture, so. Uh, so the second here. question. OK, really second moving. question would be, thank you for the 63 people. Uh, there it is. Current technologies for providing downstream passage for adult fish are effective. Yeah, so you can give the, the, the essence is on the downstream aspect, not on the upstream aspect. And uh, you can give uh, whether you disagree, whether you don't know, or whether you fully agree to this. Yes. So we actually we have a we have a little higher resolution here. You can also somewhat disagree yeah. and somewhat agree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we see that 48 percent of the participants are somewhat disagreeing. Yeah. Um, there's only two percent that are fully agreeing. Yeah. Uh, 16 percent that are fully disagreeing. 17 percent. Oh, we have a lot more response here. This is uh, 81 people. Yeah. Uh, 84, so people okay. really have an opinion here. I think we close it when we are at 100. That's a good yes, idea. And this is going to be very close. 96. Uh, 98. Wow, 103. Okay, um, you can keep uh, voting, but we uh, do need to move on to the question. To the number final three. question. Yes. And that's the final for this session. Let us see. Technical solutions. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I'm My Zoom window is in the way. Yeah. Technical solutions like fish passage can be more effective than barrier removal. Uh, also, we have a bright res ah, Thank you very much. I don't, <laughs> Great I don't response. See it. Oh, in, oh, in, yeah. Indeed. Okay. Now ah, there we go. Oh, wait. Huh? There's some. Ah, yeah. There's an interesting artifact right there. Uh, Please re re read out the question. So yeah. uh, I, I think people can see there it. There we go. Technical solutions like fish waste can be more effective than barrier removal. 48% uh, of, of our participants fully disagree. I'm kind of personally happy to see that. Um, just one person doesn't know. I, I also, I'm also not entirely surprised. Uh, 110 people have uh, responded to that already. 13% uh, somewhat agree. 3% fully agree. Yeah. Um, we have a very balanced or very, very uh, wide 
um, range of opinions here. I'm very happy to discuss this later. Yes, we will discuss this later together with the three uh, three presenters. And now we will have a, a five minute uh, break. All right. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. See you back in five minutes.
Uh, welcome back, uh, everybody. I hope you had time to grab a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. Um, for the next presentation, we will move to uh, the South America, to, uh, to Brazil. And we will have a presentation by Dr. Ronaldo Borges Barton, who has 40 years of experience of working on Amazon fish. And he is a, a, in the meantime, he's a retired researcher, that which is, makes sense after 40 years at the Emilio Goldo Museum in, in, in Brazil. And he will talk to us about the ecology, the migration, and the co conservation of Amazon fish. Ronaldo, welcome very much to the Fish Passage 21 seminar, and the floor is yours for your presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I start here moment. Uh, are you seeing? I see you, but not, not the present, your okay, presentation. Okay. Let's see what's happening. Okay. Let's see now. And now, are you think? Ronaldo, we don't see it yet. When you push share screen. Yeah. Okay. Are you working with two screens? Ah, okay, okay, I forget to share screen. Okay. Okay. When you're working with two screens, please select the right one. No rush. <laughs> and then you can find the right. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Let, Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Very much help. Well, first, I'd like to thank the invitation to participate uh, in the webinar on global solution for reef connected fishes. Let me see some screen here. Okay. One moment. Well, that's not moving. Let's, let's try again. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then So do you have one presentation open, Ronaldo? Or do you have more presentations open? Only one. Okay. And can you find it when you push share screen? So that is this. Sharing. And okay. Have you, have, are you seeing? I do okay. see a screen now. Okay. So let's but is it moving when you uh, okay, let's click see. to the next? Now it's moving. Yes, there okay. we go. Thank you very much. All right, thank good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, my intention in this presentation is to is to contribute to the discussion of the fish migration and hydropower in the Amazon. I consider it the result of the at the last 40 years of my colleagues. I intend to give an overview of dance and migration in the Amazon and then focus on an important issue related to the passage of fish in the Madero River. I'm going to start our conversation by talk about the size of the Amazon Basin. The Amazon Basin has a continental scale representing almost 40% of South America area. Beside this area, the Amazon River accounts for almost 25% of global freshwater discharge and 40% of the Atlantic Ocean sediment flow. A lot of water draws attention to issues 
related to biodiversity, irrigation, clean water, and energy. Energy is an important issue due to the growing growth of energy consumption on the continent. Among the Amazon countries, Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador stand out for their installed energy capacity and future demand. The Amazon basin can generate around 44, these two numbers, 44 gigawatts in the near future, considering existing dams and under construction dams. It represents about 3% of the world solid hydroelectric energy capacity in 2020. However, its potential is estimated at 120 gigawatts which would represent about 90%, three times more of this total. These numbers call the attention of managers, managers concerned with energy generation and environmental preservation, mainly considering that we are completing only a little more than one third of the total capacity. To access the environment cost of the hydroelectric dam in the Amazon, it's important to know where these plants are being or will be built soon. This map shows the existing dams, under construction dams, and planted dams in Amazon. In this presentation, I will compare this map with others related to the environment, fishing, and fish migration. Obviously, Hydroelectric plants require a waterfall, which makes their construction infeasible in large parts of the Amazon basin. The flats are area is represented by the sedimentary basin, which covers a large extent of the Amazon basin. This green, uh, dark co uh, green color, and this called green house. This is to everything flat. Most waterfalls are in the, are in the shoes of Brazil, and Guiana and the Andes region, this region here. Thus, a large continual extension of floodplain rivers will not be affected by hydroelectric plants, except those near the city of Porto Velho, Manaus, in Rio Madeira. The Madeira River, this is Madeira River, is one of the two exceptions where the shields, the shields is that structure, a geological structure here, the shields cross an Andean, Andean river. The other is Caquetá River in, in Colombia. The geologic, the geologic, this geologic event creates a waterfall in the middle of a floodplain river. Two hydroelectric dams had been built in the Madeira River. And so far, there is no planet dam on the Caquetá River. It's important, it is important to understand the geology of the hydrographic basin because it determines the type of water that flows from it. We may identify three types of river water in the Amazon. Black, it's gray here. Clear, the blue water here, mainly in the shoe. And white water, the white river here that comes from the end. Most control. As we can see, white water rivers are mood water rivers that flow mainly from the Andes and carry a large volume of sediments. The hydroelectric dams of the Madeira River are the only ones built in the lowlands of one Indian river. You see this, there are no other rivers, there is no dams built in, in these rivers only in Madeira River. Why it's important the end to Amazon connected and shields connected to Amazon? Is it important? Of course, both are important, but in terms of, of fish migration and sediment flow connected from the Andes to the Amazon needs more attention. First, Andean rivers carry a large volume of sediments and increase the fertility of the wetlands which sustain 
the most relevant fishing area for commercial fisheries in the Amazon. In addition, some fish species perform a long distance migration between the Amazon estuary and the foothills of the Andes. This species. Considering the sediment flow, if in fact six dams are built, which were planned to be built, these six dams here, Pongo Macerich, Pongo da Guia, Santo Forri, Inambari, Augusto de Bala, Rufita, they will reduce the supply of sediment in 71%, phosphorus 51%, and nitrogenic 24% to the entire Amazon basin. This will drastically affect the habitat and productivity of wetlands and fisheries downstream. The most important fish area exploited by commercial fisheries in the Amazon are along the main course of the Amazon River and the Ucayali River. This brown, look at this brown color, include the freshwater portion of the Amazon mouth. Annual fish production in the Amazon is unknown, but it reaches a few hundred pounds of tons, between 300 or 500,000 tons, of which, of this total, 75% is based on the migratory species. As we can see the map, large extension of these areas will not be blocked or directly affected by the dams. However, as we have seen before, and have the water can, can drastically affect the flow of sediments and nutrients and compromise downstream biological productivity. But it, the topic of this conversation is about fish passage. So I'm going to focus on fish migration. The knowledge about fish migration in the Amazon basin is limited and based mainly on the fishermen knowledge. The most important commercial migratory fish can be grouped in two types of mi migration. Long distance migration, which reach up to 2,000 kilometers, and continental scale migration, which exceeds 2,000 kilometers. Long distance migratory group is mainly composed by caracoid species, which represents about 76% of the total capture of the group. The continental migratory group is represented only by catfish. Long this migratory group is the most exploited group of fish in the Amazon. They account for approximately 58% of all cats in the Amazon. They are highly appreciated by the population, have a good price at the fish market, and are constantly under threat of overfishing. Species of this group use the floodplain, the, 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 in this, this figure, the green color, use the floodplain as nursery and adult stock area. And the confluence of clear or black water river with the mud water river of the spawning area, like this, the Rio Negro and Rio Salimões. And this is the, the confluence, the, the mud water and clear water. This map shows an example. This map here shows an example of one schedule of the annual displacement of schools of Jaraki along the Amazon River. Jaraki is represented by two species, that is Jaraki. And it is the most important fish resource in the central Amazon. Larger, large schools of Jaraki migrate between rivers of black water during the low water season, between the one river of black water to another river of black water. They move up the river into the main mud river, of the Amazon River, looking for another black water river upstream. They make this movement in one year. And in the following year, they move to another black water river upstream. And in another river, in another black water river stream, make this movement. Uh, moving up the, 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 the Amazon river system. The fishermen follow the follow schools of Jaraki to catch them with seine and surround them. 
In the Amazon Basin, Golek catfish are major river channel and swarine predator. They are, they are represented by six species of the genus Brachypastoma. Four of them, these four, are recognized for their long migration. The general patterns of Golai catfish migration is the upstream movement to spawn, followed by the passive downstream movement of eggs and larvae in the river channels to nursery habitats, which is located more than 2,000 kilometers kilometer, kilometer downstream. The most important fish for the commercial fish fishery are Piramutaba Manitoa, Piramutaba in Brazil, Manitoa in Peru, and Dorada in Brazil, e Dorado in Peru, in Colombia, also. Uh, they are important results in the Amazon, occupy the second here, Piramutaba, and the sixth position, this is Dorada, in the rank, ranking of most fished fish. And the third is Jaraki that we talked earlier. The nursery area of both species is the mouth of the Amazon River in the Brazilian territory. This is the mouth of the Amazon River. This is also the place where it is established the most powerful fishing fleet in the Amazon, the bottom pair trolley fishing fleet, this one. The trolley fish fleet fish, the trolley fleet fish go like catch fish in the freshwater portion of the Amazon estuary. You can see in this, in this picture, the, the brown color is the Amazon water, the green is the black water, and here is the, the ocean. This is the meeting of the Amazon water and the marine water. And the, the Golaket fish is, uh, live here. They grow up here. In, this is the nursery area of the Golaket fish. Uh, the spawn zone of the Golaket fish is near the Andes in the Western Amazon in Bolivia, Peruvian, Equatorian, and Colombian territory. The migration of the Dorada is one of the most spectacular in the Amazon, both for its distance, over 5,000 kilometers, and for its wide distribution, spawning in the headwater of all rivers with mud water. You can see here the hydroelectric of Madeira River blocking the, the, the migration growth of this species. The science for nature and people partnership, SNAP, has developed a conservation framework to long this migratory catfish. It was considered four main areas for management and conservation, and conservation initiative. The nursery area in the XY, the pre-adult pre area in the central Amazon, adult area in the western Amazon, and spawning or reproduction area in the foothills of the Andes. The estuary and spawning areas were identified as priority targets since the estuary has the most powerful fish fleet and hydroelectric plants in the end. The Madeira River, this is Madeira River, is a large tributary of the, of the Amazon River and has a vast headwater spawning area for volatile fish in Bolivia and Peru. The hydroelectric dams on the Madeira River block the path of schools from the estuary that would replenish the spawn stock upstream. As a result, about 25% of the spawning area is inaccessible to downstream schools. Oops, sorry. Sorry. The fishery in Bolivia was collapsed uh, with reduction of 91% of Dorado production. And the SY recruitment will be affected by the reduction of spawners, which could compromise the downstream Dorado fishery. To mitigate this impact, the two hydroelectric plants built fish passages to maintain connection between the ends and the XY. This is the fish passage from Santo Antonio Bend, further downstream. It was built on an island on the right side of the river. The river flow in this direction. And this is the detail of the channel. And these are the fish passage from the Giral Bend, 
further upstream. One is located on the right margin of the river here, and the other on the dike between the, the exit channel of the turbines and the spillway channel. This is the tail of each channel. Unfortunately, the fish passage are not work efficiently. The telemetry monitoring did not detect any fish move, moving up the river. They released fish two kilometers downstream and in the fish passage, but no one was observed in the reservoir. Uh, the importance of the, this is my, my, my message. The importance of the Madeira Dam fish passage is not trivial. Failure of the fish passage system compromises all fisheries in the basin, collapsing the upstream fisheries and jeopardizing estuary recruitment and downstream fisheries. Uh, if you want to mitigate the impact and keep fishing sustainable, we must go back to drain, drawing boards and work on an efficient fish passage. Uh, well, uh, my presentation was very short, and thank you for your, for your attention. Ronaldo, thank you very much for this, this very nice, interesting. I must compliment it for your, for your illustrations, which was uh, very, very, very good. Um, but at the same time, you also tell a sad story about, uh, yeah. about the impact of dams and the inefficiency of, uh, of a fish passage. If, if you look at them, then you almost see that they are inefficient just by simply looking at the, at, at the fish, fish, fish passage. Um, I will ask Ruben whether there are any questions for you in the, in the, in the, po in the chat. So uh, we would like to ask you a few questions. It depends, I guess, how much time we have left, Tom. We have five minutes. For okay. Yes. Uh, so I just go ahead and ask the first one. Um, so since you've been following and studying the Amazon predate, the Amazon predators for the last 40 years, uh, what, techni what technology or system um, have you predominantly been using? Like what's your favorite, I guess, field uh, kit? Is it traditional traps or telemetry or electrofishing a combination? Can you elaborate? Yeah, no, okay. Uh, I, I'm work with catfish and migration of catfish since 19... It won uh, a long time ago, and I and I work with with also with uh, Michael Golding, Dr. Michael Golding. He is studying in the Madeira River in Porto Velho, and I study in the Estuary. And we work with fishermen and uh, and fish landing, and we follow the fishermen. We we are work on board of fish boats, we follow the fishermen, catching these catfish. Uh, sometimes spend one month on a fishing boat. And uh, we put all data together, uh, data from the the, the actuary, data from the upper river Madeira, and then we we discovered, we realized the spawning area is not in Brazil. Uh, then we move up the river and go to the Peru and Bolivia, and our friends and colleagues, and we discovered that, that is the place where they spawn. Then the, we we make a uh, uh, com, 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 compilation, uh, compilation of the data to and of fishery data to understand the fish migration of the catfish. All right, thank you very much. Um, there's a bit more time, I believe. So, yes. great. Uh, so, if we understood it correctly, uh, fisheries response to to hydropower dam construction was always pretty um, bad, uh, so to speak, and. Um, we would like to know um, what do you think, what would be the most efficient, effective mitigation solution for that, for that collapse where it happens? The idea, the first idea was to, to fish passage, was to build a fish passage sure. from, from the in, 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 to dams. Uh, and this, this, fish, this, this fish passage built in these dams were built only for the Dourado, it's, not, it's only specific for Dourado, but it's not working. Unfortunately, it's not working. And the idea is to, to do again, do again, uh, resolve this problem because they spent much money to resolve this, this problem. 
And I think that the idea is put the fish in the upper, up, up part of the Amazon, up part of the Madeira River. Yeah. If, if I may add to that, uh, uh, Ronaldo, what I liked in particular with your presentation that you show the importance of sediments and knowing also in sediments in river and that uh, you talked about the black and the blue and the white rivers and that in particular those white rivers are important uh, uh, for, for the catfish. And on the other hand, building dams in rivers with a high sediment load is not the best place to build dams because the reservoirs will be filled up with sediments in no time. So it's, uh, uh, I think we should have this de debate a bit that, that that may not be a good place to build dams in the, in, in the Amazon basin. Yeah, I agree. But these two dams generate about seven gigawatts of energy. It's, it's a, a big river. And these two sediment, I think it's not a big problem for these two dams because they, are, they were built uh, in run, run of river project with bulb turbine, you know that. The, the, the sediment flow through the, the, the turbine. Don't, don't stop in, in, in the reservoir. But in that, that, that dam is not a big problem. The other dam would be a big problem. So, okay, I think we have to uh, end here, but we, we see you back in the, in the, in the discussion section uh, in a short time, and then we can have uh, additional questions to you and also address the, the comments that were made in the, in, in the poll break. Thank you very much, Ronaldo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will stay in South America. We will now go to Argentina for uh, the ne our next interview, which will be uh, with Claudio Baigan, who's a senior researcher at the Institute of Environmental Research at the National University of St. Martin. Um, Argentina is a big country, so uh, fortunately he cannot be on the spot where he has been talking about. So I understood that he would like to show uh, two slides before we start the interview. Is that correct, Claudio? Are you already uh, here? Hi, hello. Good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, Claudio. Uh, yes, well, <laughs> the map is from my university, but I want to show where the dams are located. Okay. Let's see whether that, uh, that works. Okay, let me see. Uh, presenting the slide. Okay. Yes, I can see it. Okay. Yes. Okay. The, the, the Santa Cruz River. Yes, you can see? Yes. I see a, okay. a, a yellow bar at the bottom of the slide. But you can see the map? Yes, I can see them in the map. Okay. Well, the dams are located in the south of South America, mm -hmm. specifically in the Argentine Patagonia here, close to the, the end of Patagonia. Mm -hmm. And the Santa Cruz dams are unique because there will be the first dams in Patagonia with fish waste and the unique in South America and maybe a rare case in the world uh, when fish ways are uh, built to pass exotic, exotic and native species. What, what are the exotic species you have? Okay, let, let, let's, let's show first where uh, something more close, the Santa Cruz River that flow that runs from the Andes, from here at the west to the Atlantic Ocean at the east. And in the middle course, there will be two big reservoirs, the two dams. One will be seven meters high, the other will be 40 meters high. And these are pictures that show how the rivers look like uh, in the upper part and in the lower part. Okay, so people have an idea the how the river is. Okay, the species that we have in the basin. The richness, in fact, is very poor. <laughs> we cannot compare with 
Ronald uh, Rivers, <laughs> uh, like the Madeira River. Yeah. We have, yes, uh, but the arrows indicate three anadrum species, two exotic, steelhead and Chinook, yeah. and when one is native, uh, Patagonian lamprey. Okay, uh, thank you. But um, you told us a species, but if, if we have a dam and we get reservoirs, do you think that those species will be happy with the habitats in those reservoirs? Okay, yeah. well, uh, something that is important is to understand which is, uh, which is the role of these species, because the salmonids represent important recreational fisheries in the basin, particularly in the lower basin. This is why uh, the dams would have fishways to pass these species. And the other species is native, is the lamprey, which has uh, ecological value because uh, it's an endemic species. And well, here is people fishing. And the problem here, and answering your questions, is that the dams will, uh, with the dams, the main spawning grounds of steelhead and, and lamprey will disappear. And because they will cover by the reservoirs. So this create a problem and how to deal with this because the steelhead cannot spawn outside this river. They, the species does not spawn in other, uh, in other tributaries or rivers, so only in this river. And this, and this habitat will disappear. So, um, what, what does it make sense then to build to build a fish passage? Uh, and and a second question, um, I think a lamprey and a and, and a rainbow trout steelhead will have very different uh, requirements for a, for a fish passage. Do you take those into uh, considerations with the design? Yes, well, the idea is, well, here is, is, is a picture of, of these specific spawning grounds located upstream here in this area that I told before. The, the point is this, uh, the, the project will construct a fishway for salmonids, uh, but adapted to allow the, the passage also of the lamprey. So with some modification, like for instance, in the Columbia Basin, to allow that both species use the fishway. But also the idea is to build a specific lamprey passage. Uh, not, not to copy the design, for instance, that Bonneville Dam has in the Columbia Basin because our lamprey uh, behave different as the Pacific lamprey. So, this is, these are things that should be studied more carefully and to study how to construct a fishway for lamprey that would be uh, effective. Okay, but, but I like to, to come back to the, uh, to the spawning habitat for, for, for the species. Uh, what mm -hmm. is done in, 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 in this respect? If there is no spawning habitat, then I think you will lose the populations also, also, if you have a fish passage. Okay, yes, the, and this is the, the big debate. So it makes sense, for instance, to install fishways for steelhead if we don't know at this moment if the uh, steelhead will uh, maintain the population because we lose the spawning habitats, or make sense to install a fishway for Chinook when Chinook is problematic species uh, upstreams. Even the Chinook has the spawning areas in the tributaries, not in the, in the Santa Cruz River, but the spawning areas for Chinook, for instance, are located in the national park. So uh, because the fishway costs around 50 to 60 uh, millions of dollars 
And also we need to take into account the downstream process. So for instance, collector for smalls and so on. Um, the solution is not easy. Perhaps it's more cheap and more logic to maintain the population by stocking. And uh, not, not uh, install any fish waste. I think you have a very complicated situation at hand at this uh, at this river, and I'm, I'm I fear a bit for the for, for for the for the fish populations at this moment. But perhaps I haven't heard enough of the of of of, of the story. But it's uh, um, I think the dams will have a, a, a strong impact on the fish populations. Yes, of course, and and the other point is the recreational fisheries because Chinook and Steelhead are important downstream, close to the ocean, and people want to maintain this population. Yeah. So uh, there are social issues, economic issues, and also environmental problems, uh, depending of what is the solution you take into account. Okay, Claudio, uh, it's always just a short interview, so I think I, st I have, to have to stop here. I would like to thank you very much for with the talk, and I will wish you all the best with the, the discussion uh, to, so to solve this issue between uh, yeah, the fish stocks and the dams in, in this system. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, we have now our second uh, sponsor break, because without sponsors, there would be no webinar. So here's the next sponsor break, if that's okay. Yes. Princeton Hydro has designed over 100 dam removals in the okay. north of the United States, including the largest dam removal in New Jersey. On Earth Day, just weeks after the Columbia Dam was removed, American Shad returned upstream to their native spawning grounds for the first time in over 100 years. At Low Tech, we've been advancing wildlife science for more than 35 years. Our receivers are trusted by researchers around the globe for any number of study applications. Our enhanced WHS 4350 acoustic receiver is JSATS compatible and provides approved detection range. Our new SRX 1200 receiver offers advanced features to trust the reliability of our pre and maintain your own site. During a break, we invite you to take a look at our new single and multiple antenna readers to see the many unique features. Our US website is OregonRFID.com and friends can visit us at OregonRFID.eu. Enjoy the conference and we hope to see you in person at the next one. Okay, so we are back to our final discussion section with, uh, I think Brian will be here and uh, Ronaldo and Anna. Brian has, okay.
OK. <clears throat> well, we can just uh, continue with the ones that are still there, right? For, so, for Ronaldo. Uh, Ronaldo is still there, and we'll just call into the void and see uh, what yeah. comes back, I guess. Uh, we did have a few, a few questions for Ronaldo, indeed. Um, three in total at the moment. I'm just going to read the first one out. Um, it's from uh, Henry Harrishay uh, from Alabama. He asks, uh, or he states that the poor efficiency um, of fishway seems to be a pervasive, uh, pervasive problem in South America. And um, he asks Ronaldo, in your opinion, what is the biggest obstacle uh, what, to maximizing fishway efficiency at these structures? And with these structures, I guess he means dams. I, I just wrote right to, to, to the end. In my opinion, the big obstacle is the little knowledge that we have about the biology of fish and the swimming ability. We don't know nothing about the fish. Uh, the, these dams, they, they built these dams and these fish passages, not, nothing, not, and they didn't know nothing about the fish. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, just, it's just not targeted enough, the engineering. Yeah, yeah. They, they need to know more about the fish biology. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have another two questions. Is that okay? Yes, it's sure. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, so there's a student from Brazil, uh, and he would like to know the or your opinion about the construction of some of the many dams in the Amazon basin. Um, he emphasizes the flatness of the land and asks whether the benefits of these dams, whatever they are. Um, in your opinion, outweigh the drawbacks? Well, the, the problem, in, problem in South America is energy. Energy is a commodity. Then it's a, a big problem. But uh, I, I can rank, I can say what is the most important thing we have to, to think. And uh, in my opinion, is the, the big dance in the foothills of the Andes because of the sediment. I think this is the big, big, big problem that you, you make have in the future. Okay. The third question um, is, is the Brazilian government on board with redesigning failed passage facilities, like failing non-operational passage facilities, and working to incorporate more efficient passage facilities within new constructions? Uh, the problem here is that we don't know what to do. That's the, 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 the real thing. And the Brazilian government uh, hold a meeting with the, the companies to find for solution and fresh to make pressure for solution. But uh, we need more investigation to resolve this. All right. Thank you for your time. You. Um, those were the three questions that popped up in the window right now. Um, is Claudio still here? Do you know that? I don't, I don't. Uh, I think he was. Uh... Mark, is yes, here. Claudio still here. here? Does someone yes, know? Claudio yes, Claudio is here. Okay. Yes. Uh, Claudio, would you be willing to participate in a short question, question and answer session with us? Yes, of course. Oh, wonderful. Hi, hi again. Um, I'll just go ahead and ask the question. If the dams are removed, will the reservoirs diminish and become more like rivers? So is it actually the dams that cause the reservoirs or is it like maybe the natural topology of the landscape, I guess? Um, and how will this affect fish that have become accustomed to the current situation? Uh, are, are the, Claudio, I thought that the dams are not built yet. Is that correct? They are planned. Yes, 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 are planned. One will be ready maybe in three years and the other probably in six years. Oh, right. So, so yeah. the river is a free flowing river for, yeah. from now. Okay. For now, it's, it's yes. free. Let, let me then, then rephrase the question, Claudio. Are there, could the design of the dams be changed in a way that, you, that, that they decide for lower dams, which I know that they would produce less energy, but that could keep uh, in a way uh, part of the uh, spawning habitat uh, upstream well the dam in fact the dams were uh, uh, changed the design because the first project 
was a, a very problematic project because the, the tail of the reservoir um, made contact with the Argentine Lake. And the Argentine Lake has very nice glaciers. So people was worried about the effect of the water level change in the lake and the effect on the glacier. So the dams were, um, the, yes, the, 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 the dams were changed and instead, for instance, of having seven turbines, the upper dam, now it will have only five and the lower instead five will have three. But uh, the point is that the, this, uh, this uh, particular spawning habitat will be still covered by the reservoir. So there is no way to solve this problem. Oh. That's, a, that's a pity. Okay. Yes. Uh, Ronaldo, I have a question for you. Um, do the voice of the, of the local people who are dependent of the fish catches, is that, is that listened to when uh, making decisions on where to build dams in the Amazon basin? You're muted. Ronaldo, we, we cannot hear you because you're muted. Sorry, sorry. Okay, R restart, oh, yeah. please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Excellent. I, I think they don't have a, any opinion about this. The, the local people, uh, the Amazon is a, it's not, there are many few people in the Amazon in compared with the other parts of Brazil. And the, the local people don't decide what to do, what to do. do. It, it's different here. The, the decision is all cent centralized in Brasilia, in, in the center of Brazil. Okay. But uh, is, is the, the issue of declining fish catches, is that an argument in the, the discussion or no, not at all? Uh, don't finish this discussion. Uh, uh, I have the, I hope we can resolve this problem. Hoping this, we have another dam will, that will be built in the next future, uh, uh, upward, upstream of the, the, the this dam. But uh, in my opinion, I have to try to resolve this problem. Yes, I think it's possible to resolve. Some yeah. people don't don't think same thing, but I think it's possible to resolve. Yeah, I I must say that your, your, your presentation, which, is, uh, which was very good in terms of illustration, should, should, be, yeah, should be helpful to, 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 to have this discussion on uh, where the impact of the dams are uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the system. So uh, again, my compliments for, uh, for, for, your, for, your, for, your, for your presentation. And I actually see that we have another question coming in, this time from uh, our own ranks. Pau uh, has just activated her camera. Uh, Tom, we also should not forget to discuss the results of the poll. Um, yes, we can do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we can do that also. Uh, but Pau, um, go ahead and show your question. Hi, Ruben. Hi, Tom. Hi, Pau. Uh, hi. 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 Hi from Spain. Hi. Um, hi, Ronaldo and Claudio. Wonderful uh, presentation. I wanted to take advantage a little bit for having direct um, communication here because I'm being the chat manager and I wanted to ask you both Claudio and Ronaldo one question please if somebody from South America river managers politicians uh, uh, policy makers if somebody looking to Europe looking to North America and seeing and analyzing what we have done in the past 60, 80 years. And just think, look what has happened there. 93% of fish population decline, 93% population decline. Maybe this happens in South America. It's somebody, you know, it's just, just looking to real cases, you know? Claudio, Ronaldo? Oh, the first, please. Uh, no, I think that, that it's, this, this is an issue. Yes, uh, it's interesting, the questions. Uh, from, from my perspective, uh, the answer is no, because we still are very influenced 
by uh, North Hemisphere Fishway Design. And it seems to me, this is my opinion, that there is no a technical solution for our rivers from South American rivers when you have 500, 1000 species and rivers of a scale that are not actually in Europe, except few exceptions, the Volga or other large river. The Madeira, for instance, is a tributary of the Amazon. Ronaldo has told about the Madeira. It is a tributary. The flow is around, if I, I'm not wrong, is about 10,000 cubic meters, only the tributary. Uh, the Parana River, is 17,000 cubic meters. You can install small fishways in one or two places and think that this will solve the migration of the species. Even if also because you don't know very much the ecology of the, of the fishes. So for me, and because this is very costly and working in fishway is, is, is requires state-of-the-art technology and this is expensive, I don't think we have solution. So uh, this is... And my last question, what would you recommend or what would you ask to the audience or to European politicians or to European and North American scientists, river managers, whatever, what kind of support you think or anything that we could do actually to make things better in South America? What do you think it would be helpful, you know, because that we could actually, any action, anything? I think investigation. We need more research. What, sorry? Investigation, investigation. We need to research. The, 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 okay. We need to know what is happening here. Well, look, the, the, this catfish, we, we spent four years to understand this. Two guys, few people, you know, four years. To understand. And I uh, spent a lot of money and time. We need more time, more money, more people to start here. Okay, you will not have you. Ronaldo. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very Sorry, much, Ruben. <laughs> Your floor, the floor is yours, Ruben. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, no, the next one. Actually, oh, where is it? That one? This the, one. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Pau, you are also invited to uh, stay online and uh, discuss with us if you would like to. Um, Tom, any thoughts? This is a very clear uh, uh, response of the of the audience that they think that barrier removal is uh, is more effective than uh, technical solutions and in. Uh, in general terms, I ag I agree to to uh, to, to that uh, um, to that opinion because barrier removal does much more than uh, a fishway. A fishway only um, improves if allows fish to pass, but barrier remo removal uh, um, um, re improves the, the river continuity river continuity as as a whole. Absolutely. Um, still. Um, there can be places that that where barrier removal is not uh, not an, an option, and uh, then you you should uh, should not decide to do nothing, but consider to build a fish passage. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and um, but uh, it would be interesting to hear what people uh, well said somewhat agree or fully agree that technical solutions are more effective. That they would post some of their comments in the. In the Q and A. Uh, oh, that would uh, be to, interesting indeed. Yeah, yeah absolutely. To, 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 to hear what what their uh, what their opinions are. I this, think uh, you're fully right in assuming that that I, I guess that um, yeah. many of the people who yeah. participated in the poll will probably have uh, thought exactly that that it yeah. depends on the specific yeah. site specific constellation yeah. and condition and yeah. you know maybe in maybe it, some they somewhat agree because in some cases it's just not feasible to yeah. remove the damage. It's not possible. Yeah, if you, if you go back to the first slide where we had the word cloud, there, yeah, there you see uh, what is the general feeling of the of the, of the people that uh, um, that that we come from an era of of, of fish pastures building, uh, but um, uh, we should see whether uh, where it's possible that we go for dam removal. 
and uh, have have a larger a larger ambition but that's not everywhere possible so i agree well, i yeah. fully agree but yeah, i think so. the audience agrees as well we have dam removal as the most prominent um, measure here uh, not entirely unsurprising like we uh, stated earlier but fish passage is obviously um, up here too and fish pass which uh, we just put together as fish passage so these are the two things that people think about when they think about um, restoring river connectivity yeah. and this is uh, yeah um, we like what we see I yeah. am absolutely impressed by the slope by the linear slope of this graph here <laughs> this is very very yeah, interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. and okay. we have uh, many participants that uh, that participated so we yeah. are very happy about that outcome and we definitely are going to do something yeah. with that and I think we need to move on, isn't that right? Yes, I think when we go to the closing of the of the of the first day, um, we are uh, very happy that uh, uh, that you joined us uh, uh, for during this first day. Um, it went with a few a few uh, hiccups, uh, but um, tomorrow we will do better, and Wednesday we will do much better, and uh, Thursday it will be uh, brilliant. Uh, but still. Um, despite the hiccups we we uh, thought we have managed to give you all the ingredients that we had planned uh, for um, the um, there will be now uh, there will be a demonstration and network sessions after after this uh, you shouldn't move to that the links will be placed for you in the in the chat and there will now be an announcement on the mark is that uh, coming on Mark, can we go for the announcement of the uh, Fish Passage 2022 by Brian Belgraf? Okay, that's coming now. The Columbia River flows through mountains, deserts, and farmland in the Pacific Northwest corner of the United States. The Columbia River Basin is best known for its salmon, lamprey, and sturgeon, and the challenge to support their long migrations through a river system that has been altered significantly by humans. Its tributaries, the Snake and Yakima Rivers, converge in the Tri-Cities of Washington State. That's the location for the 2022 Fish Passage Conference. Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, located next to the last free-flowing stretch of the Columbia, will host the International Conference on River Connectivity. Join us as we explore innovation for next generation fish passage technology. See advanced research being done at the laboratory and technology being tested in nearby rivers. Our organizing team includes regional research institutions, hydropower management groups, and Native American tribes. The conference will focus on global innovations in upstream and downstream fish passage. How can we help fish to get to where they are going while considering environmental justice and equity aspects of river connectivity. You'll hear about next generation turbine design and new ways to monitor fish behavior. Approaches include computer and field-based research and development that aims to improve river connectivity. Fish Passage 2022 will offer an online experience for those who can't join us in person. Either way, you'll have the opportunity to connect with partners pushing the boundaries of fish passage technology and policy to improve river connectivity around the world. You are muted, Herman. <laughs> no, no, muted. Okay, I will pretend I am Herman.
life. <laughs> no, that was double. Yeah. Go. So I'm I'm on now. Tom. I'm all set. All right. Yeah. Hey, thanks uh, everybody for watching this uh, amazing. Uh, webinar it was a it was a big challenge i have to be honest uh, we did this for the first time in the studio and uh, yeah it sometimes things happen that, that it's, it's a little bit hiccups but uh, i think it all went well we had great interviews uh, live interviews tom thank you for today actually i have a special present for you it's here on the table maybe the people saw it already uh, uh, is the happy fish statue is the the global uh, symbol for migratory fish and free flowing rivers so i'm going to give this to tom tom thank you for moderating the session here you go an Th applause for tom thank you very much and uh, tomorrow we will do better yeah but uh, let's let's go for As it i'm not ready yet so let's let's just do the last bit uh, yes of course all right let's do it uh, we are a World Fish Migration Foundation and we are here to save migratory fish and rivers. We started this foundation, the World Fish Migration Foundation, six years ago. And uh, we don't want to see fish headbanging on barriers. And we want to help these fish all around the world together with our colleagues all around the world. And we want to create, uh, we want to celebrate the success story, the success stories, the challenges uh, that we have uh, around the world, like Claudio uh, in Argentina, but also in other parts of the world. And we want to celebrate these successes and, and we want to open up rivers around the world and make people proud, especially make people proud because there are lots of great examples around the world. And one of those examples is the Dam Removal Europe movement in, 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 in Europe, but there is also an American, North American uh, Dam Removal movement. And we want to connect the dots. We want to connect the people who are working on these issues. And we want to celebrate uh, uh, migratory fish uh, we want to make fish happy. And that's why we are organizing World Fish Migration Day uh, in 2022. Again, the fifth time it will be uh, a, uh, a special event. Lots of fish art this time, and uh, we want to invite you again. And we have made uh, a new website, and uh, we want to launch it today. So from today, you can go to www.worldfishmigrationday.com and uh, uh, our team for next year it will be break free so we want to help fish to break free and even donald duck wants to help uh, migratory fish to break free and that's really nice this is a comic from uh, from finland and we might have something coming in the netherlands uh, also rather soon with donald duck so that we are really proud that these things are happening and now i want to be sure that we can hear the sound is that possible do you think mark yes yeah, should be working because if we can't hear Jeremy wait, what's the use? <laughs> huh. So Jeremy Waite is one of our ambassadors of the foundation and he's helping us with uh, 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 campaigns. And, and so what's going to happen, uh, Ruben? Nothing. It's not good. Yeah, here we go. And Jeremy has a message for you. Hello, because most of the fish that need to travel up and down rivers in order to feed or to breathe yeah. do so out of yeah. sight of humans, they need us to highlight the problems that they can face and also the solutions to those problems. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing on the next World Fish Migration Day. Events are going to range all the way from fish yeah. art competitions right the way to full-blown removal of dams. Or you can organise your own event. So note the date in your diary. It's 21st of May 2022. See you there. Yeah. Can you hear me uh, well? Yeah. Yeah. So what I hope is that we all can meet up again on World Fish Migration Day and see you there next year. And I hope to see you tomorrow, next day after tomorrow, and also on Thursday when we have the, uh, the next uh, three sessions. Um, last but not least, we have created 
we thought, let's make it ourselves a little bit more difficult than normal. Let's create breakout groups and breakout groups for special for sponsors. So we are providing a special link in the chat uh, box where you can go to breakout groups that are organized by our sponsors. And today we will have um, Innovacy, the bio, uh, AFS Bioengineering Group, Kleinschmidt, and uh, Princeton Hydro presenting uh, some of their stuff, some of their work. And something else uh, that we are going to organize is a, is a special networking event called Spatial Chat. And it will be social uh, networking. You have to go follow a link uh, that we are providing in the chat box. If I'm correct, uh, Mark, is it that provided at the moment? Super. So you can either go to the breakout groups or you can go to spatial chat and we can have a, a nice after party in, uh, in our special fishway rooms and, and all kinds of rooms that we have created. So enjoy, thank you for today. Thank you, Tom, for hosting and for moderating. Thank you to the whole team. It was a nice challenge, but we did it. And next, next and tomorrow we will do it again. I, thank you very much and uh, hope to see you again. And Mark, don't close off the webinar yet. Just leave it open for a moment. Just, uh, yeah. Now I have to go.